The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. This is not a substitute for professional medical care and is not intended for use in the diagnosis or treatment of individual conditions. Guests on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. The mention of any product, service, organization, activity, or therapy should not be construed as an ASCO endorsement. Welcome to this ASCO in Action podcast. This is ASCO's monthly podcast series that explores policy and practice issues with an impact on oncologists, the entire cancer care delivery team, and most importantly, the patients we care for, people with cancer. My name is Clifford Huddis, and I'm the CEO of ASCO. I'm also the host of the ASCO in Action podcast series. For today's podcast, I'm really delighted to have as a guest, Dr. Gary Lyman. He is co-director of the Hutchinson Institute for Cancer Outcomes Research at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, and he's also a professor of medicine, public health, and pharmacy at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Dr. Lyman is the chair of ASCO's Biosimilars Workgroup and the lead author of ASCO's statement on biosimilars in oncology, which was published in February of 2018 in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Our conversation today will focus on a range of issues that should help ASCO members better understand the use of biosimilars in cancer care. Up to now, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, has approved eight biosimilars for use here in the United States. Two of them have been approved to treat cancer, and a third was approved as a supportive care agent in the cancer setting. So with that as background, I just want to Welcome, Dr. Lyman, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Dr. Huddis. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, discuss this important topic for uh, clinical oncologists. Great. So let's just get right into this. Um, biosimilars, uh, this is a very timely topic, as, as I just mentioned. There's been um, expiration of several patents in biologic drugs recently, and there is an expectation now that we will be receiving a number of biosimilars into the marketplace. We think that cancer treatments are likely to comprise a significant number of the upcoming approvals by the FDA. And while more biosimilars will likely be available in oncology in the next several years, their specific impact on patient care is going to depend on patient and provider acceptance of these agents. That, in turn, requires that our members and all of the community have an adequate understanding of the safety and efficacy of biosimilars. So, um, Dr. Lyman, to kick off our discussion today, can you describe why ASCO decided that this was the moment to issue a formal statement on biosimilars in oncology? Uh, Certainly. Uh, The ASCO statement and the work of the panel that was commissioned by ASCO to address this, was largely focused on the education of our colleagues, in, uh, uh, patients, uh, and their, their uh, providers to inform them about the rapid changes taking place in this area. Of course, we're all thrilled about the progress of the new biologic therapies, but these have come, of course, with a downside, which is the cost of these And as the patents on uh, these biologic products that are used for cancer treatment expire, uh, there's an opportunity that uh, other manufacturers have identified to produce highly similar biologic agents and uh, provide some competition that might bring down the cost of these uh, agents. However, these are very complicated molecules uh, they cannot be reproduced exactly. And so the panel felt it was essential uh, that oncologists, as well as our patients, understand uh, the regulatory requirements, the, the way that these are approved, how efficacy and safety is assured in that process. And, and through that education, hopefully uh, lead to a better uh, understanding and a better use of these agents in actual clinical practice. As you pointed out, uh, uh, th- these are actually already in the marketplace, at least in terms of the supportive care of cancer patients going through cancer chemotherapy. And we now have uh, two approved biosimilars, uh, although they're not yet 
uh, in the market. They will be soon uh, for actual cancer treatment. Uh, so that's raising the ante uh, and in some cases concern among oncologists uh, as they go to uh, the, the biosimilar space uh, for actual cancer treatment and wanting to be sure that they're doing the best thing for their, their patients. And that's why we, uh, ASCO and, and the panel thought it was essential to really uh, inform them about the, the, the process that we go through, that the FDA goes through, uh, to assure that efficacy and safety are maintained with these new agents. So your comments here remind me that while we take some of these terms for, sta- for granted, uh, it's possible some of our listeners have a little bit of confusion in the semantics uh, between uh, generics and biosimilars. And I wonder if you could just spend a moment and clarify uh, what is a generic drug versus what is a biosimilar drug and uh, what's the same about this and, and what's different. Uh, yes, we're very familiar with, with generics. Of course, we've had generics now for, for, for decades. Uh, these tend to be, uh, small, low molecular weight, uh, chemical agents that can be, uh, reproducibly, uh, synthesized through chemical reactions in the laboratory. And you, in principle and in practice, end up with essentially identical copies of the original chemical. Uh, they can be completely characterized, they're stable, they don't tend to be immunogenic. Uh, on the other hand, uh, biosimilars, as well as the reference biologic product, the original product to some extent as well, these are larger, uh, more complicated molecules, uh, they're, they have a high molecular weight, they're very uh, heterogeneous, they're produced in living systems, which is uh, uh, which which is the essential challenge of trying to reproduce them. And uh, it's in the in the end, it's really impossible to ensure that you have produced an identical copy. Uh, so the FDA uses the term; they have to be highly similar. And we can talk more about how they characterize that, but uh, the, these are molecules that are very sensitive to external conditions. They may produce uh, an immune response. At least that needs to be monitored for. So uh, uh, the biosimilar is a highly similar uh, agent to the original biologic, the reference biologic, but is not identical, uh, just like the original biologic over time. Uh, there may be batch to batch variation, and over time, it may not be exactly the same as it was when it was originally approved by the FDA. And all that is monitored very tightly uh, by the FDA uh, over over time. So, is it fair to summarize this for the average uh, user and listener as the following: that in the area of generics, we expect the active molecule, the ingredient, to be identical regardless of where it's made and, and where it's deployed. Uh, but in contrast, we tolerate and understand that biosimilars have to have a similar effect and a similar range of activities as well as toxicities, but they're not expected to be um, identical molecules. Is that a fair high-level summary? That That's a ap- absolutely on-target uh, high-level summary. And this is why the FDA and their approval of the, the biosimilars put much more focus on the preclinical evaluation of these molecules, uh, that they're uh, structurally the same, they have the same mechanism of action. Uh, pharmacologically, they seem to be the same in both animals and er- early human studies. But there's far less focus on uh, large phase three randomized trials if the biosimilar has demonstrated all this structural and preclinical similarity to the original biologic. This saves uh, cost, of course, uh, which is one of the drivers of, of these agents to try to bring competition and, and bring down cost um, uh, while preserving uh, uh, with a high degree of uh, assuredness the uh, safety and efficacy of these agents. All right, so turning to the ASCO statement that we started to talk about, at a high level, can you summarize the topic areas that this statement actually addresses? What do you think are the key points that the listener should know? 
certainly. The ASCO statement, again, was envisioned and, and was produced as an educational effort from ASCO to inform uh, oncologists and our, our patients about what these agents are and, and all the processes that we go through. So we focus uh, particularly on uh, the safety and efficacy of biosimilars, what the clinical and regulatory standards are for uh, the development, approval, and utilization of these agents. And then we wanted to make uh, oncologists and patients uh, provide them a better understanding of some of the terminology that's utilized with biosimilars that may be foreign to them, things like interchangeability, things like switching and substitution. Uh, we wanted to also educate them about the complexities of the, the naming and the labeling of these agents. Uh, the FDA likes to keep the backbone of the, of the original uh, uh, biologic, the, the name of that, but then add a suffix to that, uh, which would indicate the specific biosimilar uh, that's being uh, utilized so that the results can be tracked over time, particularly in the post-marketing uh, period. So all this is, uh, is explained, uh, uh, as again, it's, it's somewhat foreign or n novel to the oncology community. And then uh, we spent some time talking about the value of, of biosimilars, and I've alluded to that, that since cost is one of the major drivers and one of the major challenges of the new biologic therapies, uh, as they get approved, they're driving up the cost of uh, cancer care delivery. Uh, the introduction of the biosimilars and the competition that these will uh, provide will hopefully rein in or at least bend the cost curve down uh, for the use of biologics and therefore improve access, uh, remove some of the disparities associated with cancer treatment because of limited access to those. Uh, and in the end, uh, the, the statement wanted to provide the, on, the cancer care provider with uh, as much education as we can um, uh, so that they can in turn educate their peers and educate patients in order to better understand these agents, uh, hopefully reassure them that uh, the, they're being effectively monitored uh, both before approval and, and after approval for any unexpected uh, problems, side effects, or uh, uh, changes over time as these biologic agents are. Uh, inherently capable of doing. So in the end, the statement wanted to provide both professional and public uh, education, increase awareness of these because uh, biosimilars are here to stay. Uh, and again, it, it's brand new territory, complicated issues, but ASCO uh, wants to be one of the go-to organizations to fully inform the, the profession about uh, these agents and, and their value. So that's great. Um, and I think that anybody listening who hasn't picked up the paper ought to do so because it contains, I, th I think, really valuable and clarifying information. But let's turn to the practical question now, which is uh, listeners are going to ask in a pragmatic way in the middle of clinical on a Tuesday morning, uh, how can I be sure that I'm choosing the most appropriate biosimilar when I'm given that choice in the clinic, and um, I, I would further that question by asking you: Are there particular clinical circumstances in which a oncologist should be more or less likely to consider using biosimilars? Well, again, we're in early times here, and again, I think the the information that we have, based on the supportive care agents that are available, would suggest that no red flags have arisen. Uh, the, in fact, ASCO guidelines for the use of the myeloid growth factors have explicitly stated that these, uh, any of the, either the original biologics or the, uh, biosimilars that are now available, uh, may be utilized to reduce the complications of cancer treatment. Con as we mentioned earlier, the concern rises, however, when, 
uh, as we enter this era where we have biosimilar cancer treatments, uh, things like trastuzumab uh, and uh, bevacizumab, which are now approved by the FDA and will soon be available in the marketplace. There, I think, again, the profession needs to understand, and I think the statement goes a long way to uh, informing oncologists about all the extraordinary efforts that are undertaken both by manufacturers but by the FDA and its regulatory approach to ensure that these agents are very similar. Uh, again, their mechanism of action the same, their pharmacology is the same, they have the same toxicity profile, uh, they've not shown to have any, any immunogenicity. So hopefully they will, uh, uh, will, will be reassuring and allow their utilization uh, across uh, different disease categories. Of course, we, we don't know yet how the guideline recommendations will blend these, but again, the precedent we have is that uh, with the agents that are available, uh, that they have been integrated into clinical practice guidelines. I would just add that we have one advantage here, which is that uh, the uh, these agents have been available, many of them, in Europe now for well over a decade. Uh, and the experience there has been very reassuring. Uh, none of these agents have been removed from the market uh, because of uh, unexpected uh, adverse events. Um, they, they've been very well received and, and integrated into uh, uh, care there. So we have a, a decade of experience there and, again, uh, a, a considerable effort on the part of uh, the FDA and the professional community in the U.S. to assure that we're our experience is likely to be much the same, that these are safe and efficacious alternatives uh, to uh, more expensive uh, originator agents. So let me ask the question a different way, because I think in very practical terms, uh, many listeners and members are wondering just how much they should care and when they should care. So if I turn the question around, is there a circumstance where an ASCO member or a listener who is prescribing should notice or care that their patient is receiving a biosimilar instead of the name brand product that they are used to using in the past? Well, I think we should always be concerned with the specific uh, agent that the patient's receiving and that it's either exactly the same or uh, virtually the same as what we have ordered uh, for those patients. There, there, there is a process that the FDA has been put into place that just finalized their rules for establishing a higher level of biosimilarity, and that's called interchangeability. Uh, and that uh, has not actually been granted yet to any biosimilar in the U.S., uh, but, in, but the rules have been laid down, which would say that you have to provide additional clinical evidence that you could switch from the original biologic to the biosimilar and back and forth as maybe patient goes from New York to Florida for their care and they might get a different version uh, of, of the therapy that they're on. Uh, but so there is a process in place where uh, biosimilars could be approved to be interchangeable in that sense. I think in the absence of that, it's simply uh, I I essential that oncologists know which agent the patient's receiving uh, and that any uh, unsuspected uh, adverse event or sense of a lack of efficacy is reported. Uh, again, the European experience is none of that has played out, but I think we should always be vigilant that something could emerge because of the uh, biologic nature of these products uh, that should be reported. But I think, that, again, that's true of the original, uh, the reference uh, biologic therapy over time, as I mentioned earlier. They're not exactly the same today as they were 
uh, years ago when they were approved by the FDA because of a process that we call drift uh, due to changes in manufacturing or some new uh, 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 manufacturing process, uh, these agents can differ slightly. And that's why every time there's a change in, in manufacturing, the FDA has to come back in and certify that the agent remains highly similar uh, with no meaningful clinical differences in efficacy and safety. So again, there's a process in place that is meant to both reassure the FDA and to reassure practitioners that these agents work as they're intended to. And I think oncologists should be comforted to know that that's the case. Nonetheless, again, reporting on on unexpected adverse events is, is crucial uh, to this field and that we monitor these in the post-marketing uh, period. Uh, and I know the FDA is talking uh, to ASCO and the cancer link folks in terms of using a large data effort like cancer link to continue to monitor patients even after the drugs have been approved uh, to uh, uh, make sure that any unexpected uh, complications or side effects are observed and reported in a timely fashion. So I want to just turn to one of the big motivations for this entire field, not the only one, but a big one, of course, is the promise of some cost containment. And you mentioned bending the cost curve earlier. Can you just talk for a moment about how these drugs are priced in general and what, uh, how much optimism you actually have uh, that they will control costs going forward? Yes, my uh, optimism is guarded, uh, I, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, is, as we know, the introduction of generics has, to a large extent, brought down the, uh, the cost of the, the small chemical molecules uh, that can be replicated in, in the manufacturing process. In the area of biologics and biosimilars, uh, again, it, there's no getting around that these are complicated molecules, difficult to produce in living systems. And uh, so even the production of a biosimilar, uh, not needing to do all the th- large phase three trials that the original biologic did, there's still a considerable cost in developing those. The European experience, again, would suggest that there will be some curtailing of cost due to competition. It's probably going to be more modest than the 80% reduction in cost that we've seen with some generic products. Uh, with the biosimilars, it's estimated to maybe be about a 20% reduction uh, in the cost. But we're talking about 20% of a very large number. Uh, the, the, the use of uh, biologic uh, uh, therapies uh, in the U.S. alone is 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 substantial and growing each year. So if we can uh, reduce the, the the price and, and the overall cost of cancer care delivery using these agents by the introduction of competitive biosimilars, uh, th- that I think is is a promise. But it's in the context, as you allude to, the, uh, of rising health care costs in general, uh, where the average cost or price associated with uh, new cancer drugs at time of FDA approval is in the range of $10,000 and, and often more per month uh, of treatment. So, uh, But if we can contain, curtail, or just, again, bend down that, that rising curve of health care costs, uh, biosimilars have the opportunity uh, to help, but they won't be the only solution. And obviously, there are many other areas uh, where we need to consider ways to contain rising cancer care costs. Well, I, I want to thank you. Uh, obviously, um, we could go on a long time talking about biosimilars. There is a tremendous amount for our um, audience to learn about. There is going to be, uh, I think, uh, deeper insights in the years ahead, but we do, as you point out, have the benefit of uh, building on a foundation from uh, other parts of the world where biosimilars have been in broader use for longer. Uh, and so uh, with all of that, I want to just uh, say thank you to Dr. Lyman uh, for joining me today for this ASCO in Action podcast. 
I want to um, remind everybody that ASCO is committed to enhancing confidence in biosimilars, and we want to do that through provider education as well as advocacy for federal and state policies that will ensure efficient approval, unrestricted access, and appropriate use of biosimilars going forward. If you want to learn more about the use of biosimilars in cancer care, you can find uh, ASCO's statement, the one we've been discussing today, on our website at ASCO.org. And on cancer.net, you can find patient information about biosimilars, including another podcast featuring Dr. Lyman that's intended to help patients understand the potential of these new treatments. So until next time, I just want to say Thanks to Dr. Lyman, and thanks to all of you for listening to this ASCO in Action podcast.